first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation. I used to be a pre-doc intern here at IASHP, so it's always very nice to come back. So in my talk, I will speak about entropic and metric uncertainty relations, and let's start with some historical background. So, of course, it all started with Heisenberg, but I'm not go going to go back that far in time. Let's start from the 50s, where Hirschman and Everett were the first to propose um, <coughs> using, in this case, Shannon's differential entropy to quantify uncertainty. So, it had some advantages over the variance, which I'm not going to discuss now, and Hirschman and Everett proposed a bound, which was proved in the 70s. Uh, it relied on, on deep results concerning the Fourier transform due to Beckner, and it was first observed uh, by Bielinski, Birula, and Michelski that uh, such, a, such an uncertainty principle for the usual position and momentum operators was a consequence of, uh, of this uh, result due to Beckner. Uh, so, from this one can in fact derive uh, the, the, the usual Heisenberg uncertainty, and, and it was somehow the, the first time that uh, results of this type appeared. But I'm not going to speak about, this is just for, to give uh, some background, I'm not going to speak about the continuum, rather about uh, discrete systems. So, this is our setting, we'll deal with uh, uh, D-dimensional Hilbert space, so this is the notation for at least the first half of my talk, so D will be always the dimension of H, and we distinguish some computational basis, and uh, I'm going to introduce the setting for many measurements from the very beginning, so we will have L unitary transformations of H, and, well, what are we going to do with this? We, we need some probabilities, so for a given state Psi, we will Mm. Mm. we will uh, rotate Psi by each of those matrices and then measure it in the computational basis. Right? So, so we'll, we'll just take uh, the squares of the coefficients. So for each matrix we have uh, given Psi, for each matrix we have uh, a probability distribution, L of them in total, and for each of them we can calculate the usual Shannon's entropy, which I recall here. And then you can ask about a state independent lower bound on the average entropy per measurement or per unitary transformation. So you may notice that it's given in a slightly different form than previously. Previously we had two observables and here we transform the state and measure everything in a fixed basis, but of course when you go to the adjoint matrices you can write it in terms of keeping the state fixed and rotating uh, uh, the, the basis, right? But this form appears usually in um, applications, so that's why I, I'm going to stick with this. So we are looking for bounds of this type, and the first observation we can make is that our uh, alpha cannot be larger than the number you can see here in the bottom line. Why? Well, we are looking at probability distributions on D points, so the entropy is at most log D, and we can always choose uh, the state in such a way that, for example, U1 Psi is an element of the basis, which will make one of the Shannon entropies disappear, and the rest of them is at most log D. So this 1 minus 1 over L is in fact L minus 1 divided by L. Right. So, so this is the best we can hope for in such a setting. And now, um, let, let me tell you what, what has been known for, for a long time. First, for two measurements. Here, a lot is known. And uh, so we have two matrices. We rotate the state by each of them, and we measure the state in the, in the standard basis. Uh, so the uncertainty principle here is in, phrased in terms of this parameter C, which is uh, Sometimes it's called the overlap between those matrices. Uh, and uh, somehow when you look at the basis given by the columns of the adjoint matrix, it tells you how um, incoherent, in a sense, they are. And the first uncertainty principle using the C was derived by Deutsch. It was suboptimal, so let me not discuss it in detail, the optimal in some sense result was obtained a few years later in 1989 by Massen and Ufink, and this is 
the well-known uncertainty principle due to them, it turns out that the average entropy per measurement is bounded by minus log of this C. Why did I say that it was optimal? So if we consider a mutually unbiased basis in this picture when you rotate the basis and not the state, so it corresponds to C having the, the minimum possible value, one over square root of the dimension, then here you will get uh, exactly one half log D, and this one half is exactly one minus one over L, because L equals to two. So we know that in this extreme case, uh, we cannot improve. Recently, a lot of work has been devoted to improving uh, this inequality in the regime, which is not the extreme case. Uh, so there is a result, for example, by Coles and Piani, which gives a correction in terms of the second largest coefficient of this transition matrix U1, U2 joint. But this is just for your information. I, I will not discuss this. Let me instead pass to the setting of several measurements. So now L is arbitrary, uh, to be of interest greater than two. And now again, let me recall, we have L unitary matrices. For each of them, we have the probability distribution. We calculate the Shannon entropy and average. And we want lower bounds on such an average. So if L is uh, large, and we look at D plus one mutually unbiased basis, so by this I mean that they are pairwise mutually unbiased, so this C is always one over square root of D. Well, assuming that they exist, it's not known in all the dimensions, but if they exist, if, if we have them, we get a bound of this type. And uh, you don't see this one minus one over L here, but this is consistent. You see L is very large, so it is hidden somehow in this um, minus one, right? So it does not contradict what I, what I said before. So then mutually unbiased basis work. It, I believe that it came as a surprise that for L, which may be still large but of smaller order um, than square root of D and greater than two, mutually unbiased basis did not work anymore. So in fact, one can construct examples in which, um, this is, this has been done by, by those authors, in which uh, alpha, I mean this infimum, is just one half log D. So we get exactly the same one, one half as uh, for just two measurements. We can see no improvement. And the version with one half can be obtained trivially just by applying the mass and ba bound to each <coughs> pair of our matrices and then averaging. So, so we don't get anything better. And this gave rise to, to a question, how well can we do in general if we try to choose our matrices, unitary matrices, in the best possible way. And it turned out that um, people could not go too far with uh, explicit constructions. There are certain explicit constructions in, in this paper, but they are still weaker than randomized versions that have been obtained. Like It was a natural, of course, idea to, if you don't know how to construct examples, to, to try the probabilistic method. And it was first done in this paper by Hayden, Long, Shore, and Winter, who obtained the best possible bound, but for L increasing with the dimension. So here again, you don't see this one over one um, divided by L, because for L greater than log to the four D, and this is a statement asymptotic for, for large D, it is hidden in this uh, O, big O of one. So this was an important result with many applications to, to uh, cryptography. But the, the fact that it didn't give anything for fixed L was somehow disappointing, and it was fixed in this paper by Omar Fauzi, Hayden, and Sen, where a bound of this form was obtained. Uh, what is subtracted here is just some lower order terms, which are not important at the moment. So. Mm, this was already nice because uh, when L tends to infinity, this constant in front of log D converges to one, right? And, and L can be taken independent of, of D. So this is the main result that I would like to describe in the first part of my talk. It was obtained uh, jointly with Rafał Latawa, uh, Zbigniew Puchał, and Karol Rzeczkowski. Uh, in fact, this is the year of the publication. It's a little bit older. So it turns out that 
random unitary matrices in fact give uh, the optimum bound, at least up to uh, an additive correction which is universal. So C is just some universal constant independent of anything. And it happens with high probability for large D, with probability converging to one. In fact, it is uniformly over L greater than or equal to two. And as a corollary, we, we can get an answer. If you don't care about this uh, additive constant here, this minus C, you can divide everything by log D. Forget that we are speaking about random matrices here, just uh, <coughs> the best possible choice will be better, of course, and, and obtain such a behavior for, for the limit. So it tells you somehow at this logarithmic scale how well you can do approximate, uh, how well you can do asymptotically. And uh, this answers a question posed by Long, Weiner, and Winter um, in a strong form. They asked whether, if you put lim soup there, whether you could get a bound which would converge to one when L goes to infinity. So in this form it was answered previously, but this shows that in fact this is the, the best possible bound. This, this cannot be improved. So I would like to give you a sketch of the proof of this result because it turns out to be very simple and in fact I guess we were quite lucky like at least I when we started working on it I, I didn't know anything about quantum information but somehow we were able to combine the input by Zbigniew and Karol with what we knew on, on high dimensional probability with, with Rafał Latawa and it turned out that uh, the solution was uh, not, not very complicated so it relies on this uh, probably well familiar to you notion of majorization. So let me recall that if we have two uh, vectors of dimension n, then we, we will say that p is majorized by q. If after ordering p and q from the largest coordinate to the smallest one, so this is reflected in this um, down arrow here, right? we, we look at the non-increasing rearrangement, all the partial sums of p, the largest coefficients of p, are dominated by the corresponding sums for q with equality for k equal to n. And then we have a notion of sure concavity of a function. So a function is sure concave if it takes larger values on, on states that are dominated by some other states. So here, an example of such a function, which can be checked by classical criteria, is the sum of this minus pi log pi. So if p is dominated by q, then we have this inequality here. And I don't use the letter h here, I don't call it entropy, because in fact we are going to use it not to a probability vector, but to a vector with some greater sum of coefficients, as, as you will see here in a moment. But we will reduce the question of bounding the sum of entropies to a majorization problem. And it relies on a very nice observation by Puchała, Rudnicki, and Rzeczkowski, which once you make it, it's not difficult to prove, but it turns out to be extremely useful. So in our setting, if our probabilities come just from measuring rotated states in the standard basis, uh, when we look at the direct sum or concatenation of our L probability vectors, so you just look at a vector in dimension D times L, that it turns out that the sum of the largest K coefficients is bounded by a certain number which is independent on this, the choice of the state Psi. So thanks to it we can get, we can translate it later in the state independent lower bounds for entropy. And what is this SK? So the square root of SK is obtained in the following way. You look at the adjoints of uh, our matrix, unitary matrices, U1 up to UL. You put them one next to another, you concatenate them into one big matrix of uh, size D by LD. And then you select the submatrix with K columns, which has the largest possible operator norm. So this operator norm will, will be the square root of SK. And um, SK will, will satisfy such an inequality. So now it's pretty clear what we should do in the context of random matrices. We should just bound those numbers 
a scale with high probability. What is important is that we want to bound them, uh, not individually, but we want to control the whole growth of this sequence SK with high probability. Well, fortunately, it's not really more difficult because we have quite strong concentration. So, so this is the result. Uh, with high probability, for all k smaller than this L times D, the square root of SK behaves in this way. And the proof of this fact uses just the classical tools from high dimensional probability. So, uh, we look at a bunch of operator norms here. So an operator norm is a supremum of, of some functions over the sphere. So you discretize the sphere. Then uh, for each element of your discretized set, uh, you use the concentration of measure result, which uh, we have here because we have very strong concentration. It's the unitary group. Uh, by the way, I should have said it from the very beginning, but somehow implicitly I assumed it. All random unitary matrices I, I'm speaking about are hard distributed, right? That's why we have um, strong concentration. And then uh, you just use the union bound. So, so this is uh, all very easy. Uh, however, let me stress that, that it's exactly here that we gain with respect to the previous approaches, because uh, by using this majorization and reducing the problem to studying operator norms, we can work with functions which have Lipschitz constant equal to one with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. And concentration for random unitary matrices is expressed for Lipschitz functions with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. Whereas working directly with entropy and using the same toolbox results in considering functions with increasing uh, Lipschitz norm, increasing with the dimension, and this produces some other factors which have to be taken into account. So, so now the, the conclusion of the proof is very simple. We just use this bound on SK compare, combined with, with the previous inequality to find a uh, deterministic state-independent vector Q which majorizes such a sum. And then we use this sure concavity of entropy to bound the sum of minus pi log pi, which turns out to be the sum of the Shannon entropies of our mm, probability distributions, by this function evaluated on, on, on our deterministic vector Q. So then you have to estimate this function, which is tedious, but these are just, just calculations. So, so I believe that this is, in fact, pretty, everything here is pretty straightforward. Okay, so, so this was the entropic uncertainty principle, but let me now pass to metric uncertainty principles, and for this I, I will need to change the point of view slightly. So now uh, let's forget about this 1 minus 1 over L for a moment, which was previously here. Let's replace it with epsilon, and we may ask the question in the following form. Given epsilon, how many matrices do we need so that such inequality holds independently of the chosen state psi? And if you disregard this additive constants that we had, then the previous result uh, tells us that it's roughly, in this case, L is uh, 1 over <coughs> epsilon. So now when you play a little bit with this inequality and move certain things around, you can see that it is in fact equivalent to the following formulation. Now we want to bound from above the kullback leibler distance from uh, between, I mean not distance, divergence, right, f between P, uh, the, the probability rela related to measurement, uh, measuring the state ui psi, to the uniform distribution on the points. It is just rewriting everything. And well, philosophically, of course, it's clear, like large entropy means that we have something close to uniform and uh, small kullback leibler divergence means the same, right? But here, if we think of the kullback leibler divergence, even though it's not a distance, let, let's think of it as a distance, then this ep log d is something like a diameter, right? It, it tells you roughly what is the largest divergence on a set of probability measures on d points from the uniform distribution. So such an inequality tells you that on average this 
distance to uniform distribution is small with respect to the diameter. So now we can ask a question if we can replace this schoolback leibler divergence with some real distance and what can it be? So this was the starting point um, of um, uh, the paper I mentioned before. So in fact, the um, entropic uncertainty principles obtained by Fauzi, Hayden and Sen were derived from looking at such a problem for the total variation distance. And then I wanted to, when I learned about this paper, I wanted to check what its relation to our paper was. And uh, by doing this, I um, somehow started investigating other distances, which I will, I will mention in a minute. So let me now describe to you what is the result by Fauzi, Hayden, and Sen, uh, and what is their setting. So they also have deterministic results. I, I'm going to speak only about uh, the random part of the paper. So it turns out that to look at such uncertainty principles in the total variation distance, you need to change the setting slightly. So you need an ancilla space. So now H will be a tensor product of HA and HB. D will be still the dimension of the big space H and the dimension of HI and HB will be DA uh, and DB, respectively. And in each factor, we will distinguish an orthonormal basis, and we will look at unitary transformations of the big space. So now, but when we have to, in this setting, we have to define our probabilities. So we will look here only at this factor HA. So our probabilities are defined by, by this formula here. So you can look at it, of course, in, in two ways. Either you can say that you look at this tensor product basis in the big space, you measure the state psi in this basis, and then it gives you a distribution on the a Cartesian product of uh, uh, dA uh, um, set with dA elements and a set of db elements, right? And then you look at the marginal. Equivalently, you may say that Alice is measuring this, uh, sh if, if we associate Alice and Bob with A and B, that uh, they share a bipartite quantum state, and Alice is performing a measurement on her part of the system, right, in, in her computational basis. Mm, and now we'll be concerned only with this uncertainty about those measurements of, um, of Alice, right? So now, the question is, again, as before, given epsilon, can you find matrices, and how if so, how many of them do you need, so that independently of the state, the average total variation distance between the result of a measurement by Alice on the i-th rotated state is close to the uniform distribution now on dA points, right, because we measure only on this subsystem HA. And we want it to be smaller than epsilon. We don't have anything dimension dependent here because the diameter of the probability simplex in the total variation distance is now one, right? So previously it was log D, now we want something dimension dependent here. And it turns out that the answer is, in fact, affirmative. So if this ancilla space is of dimension at least uh, of the order one over epsilon squared, and the number of measurements is a little bit, a little bit larger, like uh, log one over epsilon over epsilon squared, then random unitary matrices will do with high probability, you will get this type of uncertainty principle. So mm, let me remark that, in fact, if you write this expression in terms of certain by linear forms or quadratic forms, you can use a polarization trick to reduce this log of one over epsilon, which is not a big deal, of course, but I want to mention it because it turns out that then the result becomes, in fact, uh, optimal up to those constants, capital C. So it turns out that we have any, this is a deterministic statement, uh, deterministic matrices U1 up to UL, which satisfy such an uncertainty principle, then we need many of them, L should be of this order, and we do need this ancilla. So, so this statement 
this is very easy. Like, for example, if you want to get a bound on dB, you just evaluate this expression on a random state and do some calculations. And uh, the bound on L follows, when you write, it, write down this expression carefully and you see there are some operator norms, you can replace them by introducing some dimension-dependent factors by the Hilbert-Schmidt norms. And then th the only thing that you use here is this uh, well-known fact, right, that when you have, say, L unit vectors in a Hilbert space, now we have a Hilbert space because we are looking at the Hilbert-Schmidt norm, then you, L unit vectors, then you can take their linear combination with uh, coefficients plus minus one in such a way that you will get a vector of uh, length square root of L. Right? So, so uh, if you are a probabilist, you will choose uh, the, the signs at random. If you are a high school student, you will do it in a greedy way. Right? It's, it's a very elementary fact. So, so there is nothing deep behind this proposition, but it shows uh, the difference between uh, the kullback leibler or entropic uncertainty and the total variation metric uncertainty. So for kullback leibler given epsilon, if you want the uncertainty or maybe the distance to uniform to be epsilon small with respect to the diameter, we need L of the order 1 over epsilon and there is no need for this ancilla space. For the total variation, you need both. You need mm, a larger number of measurements and you need this, this ancilla. So uh, when I first started looking at this problem, I thought naively that perhaps there could be some trade-off that, for example, if we take dB very large, then we can gain on L and uh, have L smaller or the other way around. But it turns out that no, bo both need to be large. So in particular, mm, mm, you cannot uh, pass through total variation uncertainty to, to derive those optimal entropic uncertainty. So, in some sense, this would be the end of the picture, but uh, I decided to have a closer look at what happens if you still perform one more change, you change the distance. So, the possibility of doing something like that uh, was already hinted at in, in this paper by Fauzi, Hayden, and Sen, and you may look at the Hellinger distance. Uh, what is it? So I guess it's, well, this is the formula, but I guess it, the intuition behind it is best described. If you say that for the total variation distance, you parameterize the set of probability measures by the simplex and look at L1-like distance. And here you parameterize the set of probability measures by a piece of the unique sphere, and you look at the Euclidean distance. So this Hellinger distance is greater than the total variation distance. And it can happen, then they are both small, but the total variation distance is indeed of the order Hellinger distance squared. So it is related to what in statistics is called uh, Bhattacharya coefficient, and here could be called probably classical fidelity. Classical because we are looking only at diagonal matrices here. So the fidelity between two probability measures is just the inner product between the mm, vectors from the unit sphere that parameterize them. Right? And it's easy to check that this Hellinger distance is expressed by this formula. So, so the Hellinger distance will be small if this fidelity is close to, mm, to 1. Right, so, so this is the result that one can obtain. Mm. Let me perhaps first state it in, in terms of fidelity. So again, for random unitary matrices with high probability, if L and dB are in the setting uh, with ancilla spaces are greater than C over epsilon, then we have the following fidelity uncertainty principle. The average fidelity uh, minimized over possible states will be still epsilon close to one. This is a nicer formulation than the one above, which is equivalent, but I want to state this this one too, because it will give us a comparison with the previous result. So it's basically the same statement as before, but there are two differences with respect to this mm, Fauzi, Hayden, and Sen result. We look at this Hellinger distance, and to the extent of the arithmetic mean, we look at the quadratic mean. 
And it happens at the same range of parameters if, if we disregard absolute constants. Right? So, um, so perhaps this statement is not very appealing because you may say that philosophically it's, it's more of the same, right? It's, uh, again, some distance between, uh, average distance between probability distributions obtained from measurements in, in random basis to the uniform distribution is small. So, Mm, there are some reasons to mm, investigate such a formulation and, well, I can see three reasons. So, so the first one is perhaps not con will not be very convincing to you. So uh, I read a lot when I was reading the paper by those authors and trying to improve at the same time. So I, I guess it's always a <laughs> good idea to, to learn something, but uh, to show something more convincing, uh, it turns out that the method of proof is, shows certain phenomena related to things that appear in other branches of mathematics, for example, in asymptotic geometric analysis or, or, or in computer science. So, so it's always nice to have certain analogies. And also, when you try to follow those authors uh, in certain applications, it turns out that working with such uncertainty principles can lead to results which are, in a certain sense, optimal. So, so this is some justification of, for um, looking at, at this change distance. Uh, quite surprisingly, uh, it turns out that if we have something like that, but not for the quadratic mean, but for the arithmetic mean, it is not enough to, uh, to obtain uh, those optimal results. You, you do need this fidelity form or this quadratic mean here. But let me first say something about the um, relations with, with uh, other fields of mathematics that, that I mentioned. So in fact, what is behind this statement is a more general fact, which uh, perhaps the formulation is quite complicated here. So let, let me not read it, but let me start from the inequality we have here. So we look at the same expression we had before. So this is the quadratic mean of these uh, distances of our probability vectors obtained by measurements to the uniform distribution. But now the supremum is not taken over all states, but just over some subset of the, of the sphere. So of course, it, we expect it uh, to be, to be something smaller than if we maximize over the whole sphere. And it turns out that we can bound something like that for an arbitrary subset by an expression depending on the dimension of this ancilla space, which actually, it does not depend on the set, it corresponds to moving this expectation inside the supremum. Plus something which depends on the behavior of the Gauss, standard Gaussian process on our, the supremum of the Gaussian process on our set. So it's more convenient to look here at the Hilbert uh, space H as a real Hilbert space, and not on it we have a standard Gaussian vector, and we can define a Gaussian process just by taking inner products in this real space with this Gaussian vector. So I could, of course, write it down in terms of a complex Gaussian vector, but this is how it is used in theorems usually. So. So we look at, a, oh, there should be no expectation inside, of course, right? It, it should be uh, only outside, right? So um, I'm sorry for that. So, so we look at the supremum of a standard Gaussian process on our set. You integrate it, and we can think of it as some sort of measure of magnitude of size of the set lambda. This is sometimes called Gaussian mean width. And in fact, we saw it today. Um, when we heard about the johnson linden strauss lemma, so the fact that the dependence on the number of points is log k, this log k is the square of the mean maximum win, mean width of k points on the unit sphere, right? thanks to Gaussian concentration. So, so results of this type where you can get something by measuring the size of the set by, by Gaussian processes, uh, are known from first from local theory of Banach spaces, then from the theory of dimension reduction, like generalized johnson linder strauss lemma, so covariance estimation. And here we see that if this Gaussian process is, the smaller it is, 
the smaller L we can take to, to have the right-hand side small. So if we look at the whole unit sphere, then it is easy to see that the supremum of the, over the whole sphere will be of the order square root of 2D. This D cancels, and we see that L should be of the order 1 over epsilon squared to introduce epsilon here on the right-hand side. So this is how it appears. OK, so um, just a few words on the proof. This is uh, a not very difficult adaptation of uh, an argument used by Gideon Schechtman to, to uh, improve the dependence on epsilon in the Dvoretsky theorem about uh, sections of, of uh, convex bodies. And here there are some technical difficulties when you work with unitary matrices and uh, with complex numbers, but it's not very difficult. We just show that the increments of our stochastic process that we investigate uh, have sub-Gaussian tails. And then it is uh, a deep result in uh, the theory of Gaussian processes due to Michel Talagrand that uh, uh, a supremum of a sub-Gaussian process can be compared with a supremum of the Gaussian process. So, so this is how, how we proceed. OK, so in the remaining part of my talk, let me show you some applications of those results. So I would like to show you two applications. The first one is to information locking, which was first introduced by those authors in uh, like 13 years ago. So informally, information locking is a situation in which Alice can encode a long uh, uh, classical message in a quantum state which she, sh she shares with Bob. And initially, Bob cannot learn anything about this message by performing measurements on his, parts, on his part of the system. <clears throat> but remember that this message is long. It turns out that it's enough for Alice to send, him, send to Bob a few bits, really a few bits, and um, <clears throat> then having those, knowing those additional bits, this key, which was previously secret, he can decode perfectly. So, uh, in the paper where uh, this notion was introduced, they were measuring these uh, things in terms of some uh, classical mutual information of the quantum state, and uh, they provided a, a full protocol, but they analyzed it in detail only for uh, uh, sending one bit. So I should also say that this is locked, right? The, I, Intuition behind this is that this uh, classical information was locked in the quantum state and was unlocked by sending these few bits. So <clears throat> initially those authors were showing how many bits we, you can unlock by, uh, or lock with a key of a given length, I mean with, with one bit only, and our results translate directly with their analysis, those results on entropic uncertainty matrices, in a bounce on how many bits you can unlock if you have, uh, if you use 2D qubits to uh, store this classical information and a key of, of uh, length, uh, of a fixed length. Right, so. so this is in this context of uh, um, um, entropic uncertainty principles. And this fidelity uncertainty gives some refinements in a protocol introduced by Fauzi, Hayden, and Sen in the context of locking in this total variation distance. So <clears throat> let, me, let me state it here. Five minutes, uh, five minutes okay. Uh, so the formulation is, is quite complicated here, so, so uh, um, do not read the theorem. Let's just see, uh, this, the situation is as follows. We have X, which is a message uh, encoded by n classical bits. And we encode it as a basis vector in a space of dimension 2 to the n. Then we choose at random another basis vector from this auxiliary space of dimension dB. We rotate it with one of the set of matrices that we have, and we send it to Bob. So then. It turns out that basically under center assumptions of the message X, which is random, if Bob doesn't know which matrix UK we used, we select it from the set of L matrices. Right. Which matrix was used, if it's unknown, then 
by performing any measurement on his state, he can learn very little in the Bayesian form. The, the a posteriori distribution given the result of the measurement is very close to the uh, a priori distribution. So he doesn't learn at all. Mm. But of course, when you look at it, if you know what k is, then it turns out that different messages are encoded in different orthogonal subspaces. So you can, in fact, decode perfectly. So, so this is the Bayesian formulation of the same phenomenon. And, and the application of this fidelity uncertainty relations allowed to improve certain dependencies here to, to something which is, in, in some sense, optimal. <coughs> so in the three minutes that I have, let me have my, my final, uh, final, uh, final application. This is to um, quantum data hiding. So here I don't want you to, to, to read the result at all. Let me just say that by exploring the full strength of this result that you may not look at the total, the, the full space, uh, the, the full set of all quantum, uh, quantum states, but you can instead look at subspace, uh, sub, uh, subsets, sorry. Mm, then it turns out that you can run this fuzzy hayden sen protocol with just one matrix. And then it gives you some data hiding schemes. So data hiding is about a boss who uh, encodes some information and shares to his employees, Alice and Bob, and he controls the quantum communication between them. So all they can do is to, uh, if he doesn't allow any quantum communication, is to perform local operations in their labs and communicate classically. And then it turns out that they cannot encode the message. But if we allow for a global measurement, then you can decode perfectly. So, so it can be, it's the same statement as before. It can be interpreted as locking against, in some sense, as locking against uh, separable measurements here. And it gives you mm, some results on how many qubits you need to mm, lock, sorry, to, to hide a message. It in, depends on it's some sort of interpolation. So it's a Bayesian bound, but if you have a completely random message, then you need only n plus something independent of n, that many qubits, and the guarantee you get is Bayesian in, in its form. When you want to mm, get arbitrary mm, distribution, height arbitrary distribution, it turns out that you need this number of qubits, which is optimal by a result by Andreas Winter, which was announced one year ago exactly in this room. So you can check it out. Uh, and it corresponds to, to the classical notion of, of data hiding. So it's some sort of interpolation. And let me stop here. Thank you.